a very different part because it's going into the fact that everyone is going for baptism. It's not just talking about John anymore. It's now talking about what John is doing, if that's clear. It's different to me, <laughs> okay? So I'm just gonna move on. I was told by some friends of mine that there actually already is a project like this that's totally complete. The Chronological Gospels, compiled by Michael Rood, among others, and others. In fact, there are quite a few of these gospel harmonies that have been completed since the time that Jesus walked the earth. I had no idea that this all existed, that these works had been done. But I'm glad I completed my project because now I can add my work to the list. The Chronological Gospels, compiled by Michael Rood, and I actually already knew who he was. I just didn't know he did that. So I ordered my own of his chronological gospel. I saw some of his uh, stuff where he does a lot of retranslation. He uh, replaces the Lord and God with Yahovah. And he replaces a lot of the names with how they would be pronounced in Hebrew, like Yohanan instead of John. I don't think I want to do that. I'm not exactly sure. I might have two different versions. One where I translate names or I just take out the title of God and put in God's name. But I'm definitely going to see his explanation of this because if he's already done all this work, I'm not going to copy him, but I am going to reference his work. If maybe if he does something very different from what I've done so far, if I can contact him and uh, he can inform me of where I was wrong. This is... The Chronological Gospels. This is by Michael Rood. I didn't know about this before I started. I was told there's actually some others, which I may buy as well. And I've been going through this. I pretty much read through the whole thing. He includes Acts and also Revelation. But the part that I'm concerned about is the Gospels, because that's my project. And praise God, he actually did a whole lot of the work for me, for everyone putting it all in order. I knew that was going to be the most difficult part, actually figuring out what happened before another, what the order was of all the different events, the times, the places that Jesus went to. Although he doesn't do what I'm doing, which is to combine the verses into one single chronology. He has a timeline. He actually has it on a, a sheet of paper where you can go through, which is amazing. I love that. But he still leaves it in the different gospel accounts. So you still have to read every single word in all four of the gospels, which can get tedious and annoying. So the chronology is done. That's great. That is a whole lot of work that I don't have to go through, but I'm still going to continue this project. I'm still going to put everything into one chronology, one timeline, so that you only have to read events one time and you don't have to reread the same thing as it was written by the different gospel writers. I'm not doing any retranslation. That's why I want to have a few versions, but one where I do because there are a lot of things. There are a lot of things that Michael Rood talks about. He's got a lot of notes. He's got a, I mean, look at this. This is the size of my Bible. Right? And this is only the gospels Acts and Revelation. He's got a lot of notes. Some of what he's saying I totally agree with. But I have a lot of questions. I think, I'm going to be straight up, I think he's wrong about some stuff. Some of the stuff I mentioned earlier, like when Mary got her angelic visitation, I don't think we should assume she hid anything from Joseph. And then after that, they got married and Jesus was born. <music> Translation theorists have often used a continuum like this one, ranging from more literal to less literal, to describe the various English versions, and they'll place each one at a point somewhere on this continuum. But I think it would be more appropriate to assign a range. In fact, each translation really has two ranges. They have the ideal range and the real range. The ideal range is the stated goals of the translators. That's their target area. They are aiming for that part of the continuum. A lot of books and articles have been written about translation, and quite a few of them have been written about the translation debate, the literal debate. How literal should a translation be? But as I read these books and articles, I find that 
most of them focus almost exclusively on the ideal side, on the stated goals of the translators. Now that's important when the translators outline their objectives in their prefaces, in the preface to their translation, that they're making some important significant statements. But I think that the translators are also making significant statements by their translational choices. For example, when the ESV and NASB decided not to go with a word-for-word -word rendering in Psalm 44:14, instead they translated it as laughing stock, the, the statement that they were making at that point is, it's okay to set aside the, the exact words of the original and replace them with a dynamic interpretation. Translation has often been illustrated by the meaning-based translation model where the translator would start with the source language text, dig beneath the surface to discover the meaning, and then re-express that very same meaning in appropriate receptor language or target language forms. Now, this model has most often been identified with dynamic equivalence or meaning-based, also called idiomatic translations of scripture. In response to the rise in popularity of dynamic equivalence translation, the term formal equivalence was coined. And presumably, formal equivalence translation could be illustrated by a modified version of this model, which would skip the discovery and re-expression stages, where the translator would simply start with the source language form and try to find the equivalent form in the target language. But is this really the process that was followed by the translators of our literal versions? Well, as I look at the literal versions, I have never seen any of them that have consistently followed this model. As we think about the relation between the form of the message and the meaning of the message, one of the very best places to start is with idioms and figurative language. Because idioms and figurative language will lead us to some pretty obvious conclusions that then, of course, those same conclusions can be applied to other areas of language. An example of this is with the, the term warm-hearted. In English, we say warm-hearted when we're talking about someone who is kind and compassionate. Now, if we wanted to translate that literally into Lamogai, we can do that. If we wanted to go form to form, we could literally translate that as Antoi Neingil. The problem is, in Lamogai, warm-hearted means angry. So, the translator has translated literally word for word, but has he been a faithful translator? Well, in this case, no. It's not a true statement across the board to say that literal translation or word-for-word -word translation is more faithful or more accurate. Sometimes perhaps it is, but it is not in every case. In this case, a literal word-for-word -word rendering of warm-hearted would actually corrupt the meaning. A related term is cold-hearted, which when we say that in English, we're talking about someone who is ruthless and cruel. And again, we can literally translate this into Lamogai, Antoi Nevris. Unsurprisingly, cold-hearted in Lamogai is the opposite of warm-hearted. It means he's not angry anymore. He's cooled off. He's calmed down. Now, a third related term is hard-hearted, which means stubborn and unteachable. And again, this can be literally translated into Lamogai, Antoi ne namor. But this creates a different kind of a problem. What in the world does that mean? It's meaningless in Lamogai. So in Lamogai, rather than saying his heart is hard, which means he's stubborn and unteachable, they would dig beneath the surface, and on the, on the other side, in Lamogai, they would say, Weine kauk, which literally means his ears are closed. And I can tell you that all the different ways that we use his heart is hard, and the way the Lamogai people use Weine kauk, his ears are closed, the meaning is virtually identical. Of course, to do this, that means changing to a completely different body part. So is that okay, or is that perhaps going too far as a translator? Well, let's illustrate this by looking at another example from a real language. In English, sometimes we talk about the heart as being the seat of the emotions and the seat of the intellect, as in Job 19.27, where it says, my heart faints within me. Well, what if another language, instead of heart, said, my kidneys faint within me? Or instead of, my mind instructs me, my kidneys instruct me. Instead of, I was pierced within, I was pierced in my kidneys. Or, instead of, you formed my inward parts, you formed my kidneys. Does that sound okay? Well, some of you may be surprised to find that the language that uses kidneys in these four examples is actually Hebrew. This is the original. The, the renderings, heart, mind, within, and inward parts, those are the cultural adaptations in English. It's the common word for kidneys in Hebrew, which 
is often translated literally as kidneys when it's talking about the offerings and sacrifices on the altar. Like in Leviticus 9.10, on the altar he burned the fat, the kidneys, and the covering of the liver. Of course, in many other contexts where it's really talking about the seat of the emotions and the intellect, it's translated in a lot of different ways. Now to focus again on two fairly literal versions, the ESV and the NASB, they allowed themselves quite a bit of leeway in the way they handled this concept, this term. Sometimes they both translated it heart, sometimes they both translated it mind, sometimes the ESV translated it heart while the NASB translated it mind. Is there a difference between the heart and the mind in Scripture? Well, I think there is, but that could be difficult to prove by the NASB and ESV renderings of the Hebrew and Greek words for kidneys. Of course, Hebrew and Greek also use the words heart and mind in some other contexts. So as a translator, I found myself facing some unexpected challenges, and I had to ask myself questions like, are literal versions really literal? And why do they abandon their own rules so frequently, even in places where they really didn't have to? It's we as English speakers have been incredibly blessed with a wide variety of Bible versions. We can lay a dozen different Bible versions down side by side and come away with a better understanding of Scripture than someone who always only just reads one version. Of course, in many languages around the world, they have no choice. They only have one version or they have no versions. Sometimes I think instead of recognizing this as a blessing, it ends up being a curse and we use it to argue with one another. As a career Bible translator, I'm passionate about helping people understand the truth about translation. And frankly, as I've talked with Christians in the English-speaking world, I've seen that there is a lot of confusion about translation. So I've written this book, One Bible, Many Versions, Are All Translations Created Equal, published by InterVarsity Press. And my prayer is that this book will raise the light level of the average English-speaking Christian, helping them to understand the truth about translation. And I really think that as people understand the truth about translation, they'll be a lot less dogmatic. You know, everyone has their favorite version, and that's perfectly appropriate. It's fine to have a favorite version, but what I don't think is fine is to criticize other versions that may not be your favorite version. Because I can show you many places where your favorite version does all the same things that you might criticize that other version about. If you read this book, you'll see many, many examples. So my prayer is that this book will inject a fresh dose of realism and civility into the whole translation discussion. Thank you very much.